Hello everyone, Sigourney Weaver here. I hope you're all having a fabulous night. I'm so sorry I can't be with you live, although over Zoom you probably wouldn't know the difference anyway, but just pretend I'm there because I wish I were. In any case, you have my good friends James Cameron, John Lando, and Stephen Lang with you, so you're in really good hands. I'm here tonight to introduce you to my good friend Lucy Lang. Lucy's a native New Yorker, and such an inspiring female leader. She's running to bring real change to our criminal justice system as the next Manhattan district attorney. Lucy's devoted her life to the community and to changing the system from inside and out, both as a former district attorney and as a criminal justice reform leader at John Jay College. Lucy recognizes that the role of district attorney is about much more than just prosecution. Keeping our city safe means creating a justice system that works for everyone. Good evening, and welcome to this conversation with Lucy Lang. My name is Stephen Lang, and I'm the candidate's father. A number of Sigourney's legendary performances have come to life through the films of another friend, a legend in his own right, James Cameron has been blazing trails in cinema for over 40 years. As writer, producer, and director, he has created such classics as The Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, T2, True Lives, Titanic, and of course, Avatar. And in so doing, Jim has been the leader in creating some of the truly iconic women in the history of cinema. I'd like to introduce to you James Cameron, Kia Ora, Jim. Well, thanks, Slang, for those extremely kind words. I think it's safe to say that you've cemented your place in the cast of Avatar 4 and 5. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all of you for being here to celebrate with us a new year, a new administration, a brighter future and the promise of overdue reforms to the American criminal justice system. I'm sure you know the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in history with more than 2 million people behind bars and a hugely disproportionate percentage of them are people of color. And across the country, prosecutors are being elected on platforms that seek to address these problems and this evening, we will hear from one such candidate, Lucy Lang, who's running for a Manhattan district attorney. It's my pleasure to introduce both John and Lucy for a discussion on New York City and the future of criminal justice. Take it away, guys. Thank you very much, Jim. Lucy, I, I wanna start with a very, very basic question. What does a DA do and why should people care about who their DA is. The prosecutors are vested with tremendous discretion in deciding what laws to enforce and how to enforce them. So that means everything from what to do when someone jumps the turnstile in the subway to what to do when someone is shot and killed to large scale bank fraud. And all of that falls under the jurisdiction of the local DA. So people should care because they should care what happens to uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness, who've traditionally been wrapped up in the criminal justice system. They should care because when they are victimized, they should care about how that office is positioned to respond to their victimization. And increasingly, it's incredibly exciting to see Americans starting to pay attention to the incredible impact that district attorneys can have on standards of safety, equity, and dignity in our communities. Well, that, that certainly helps uh, clarify it for me anyway. Uh, you know, every time we've spoken, I've been struck by um, your telling of stories. You're telling of stories about people because that's, that's something we do in the film industry. You know, we make movies to tell stories about people. So I, I want to ask you, what, what story has, has stayed with you about people from your years as the assistant district attorney? A story that really has stayed with me is from when I was a very junior lawyer at the district attorney's office handling misdemeanor cases, so low level cases. And a case came in in which a neighbor had called the police because they heard a ruckus in an apartment 
And when the police responded, they arrested uh, a man and his wife because the man had broken a light bulb with a broomstick and she had pushed him. So they arrested both of them and brought them down on misdemeanor complaints. Over the course of many, many months, I developed a relationship with the woman and came to learn that in fact, she had been the victim of terrible and ongoing abuse for more than eight years at the hands of her live-in partner. And that he would do everything from uh, wait for her outside of her employment and garnish her wages to brutally beat her underneath her clothes so that her employers wouldn't see, uh, to keep her locked inside the apartment for weeks on end. And she had been afraid to report it because of the fact that she was undocumented and was afraid that if she called the police or if she went to the district attorney, that she would face deportation. So I met with her in her own neighborhood, near her employment, wherever worked for her. I sought support from clinicians and social workers. I worked to ensure that she was able to secure uh, what's known as a U visa that supports people who are, are victims of crimes to ensure that they're not deported. And ultimately, she testified in the grand jury and the case proceeded against her abuser and the relationship ended. We stayed in touch over the years and she called me several years later to say that she'd moved to the Bronx and she wanted to tell me that unfortunately she had gotten in another abusive relationship, but that this time she had had the courage to call the police herself and to go to the district attorney's office because she knew that she would be taken care of and remove the, the abusive situation would end. She called me again several years later to tell me that her daughter had just had a child and she wanted me to know that her daughter had selected the name Lucy for her child because she felt that but for the intervention of the district attorney's office and our work together, her mother wouldn't have been around to meet her granddaughter. And to me, I hold that woman's powerful story as the potential, part of the potential of what the office of the district attorney can do to support people who are victimized in our communities. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, specifically around uh, racial justice and mass incarceration, which are two big issues in New York, you know, how, how can the DA affect public policy around those two issues? I'm committed to a district attorney's office that takes solving mass incarceration in our lifetime as an express goal. And that is something that we can and must do if I have learned anything from the incarcerated New Yorkers whom I have worked with. But it requires everything from declining to prosecute cases that don't belong in the criminal justice system. That means things like um, marijuana smoking. And it means diverting cases out of the criminal justice system that belong in other systems. Um, mental health challenges, substance misuse, poverty, none of those things should be treated by the criminal justice system, although for a generation we have been. And all of those kinds of prosecutions have contributed to the overcriminalization of communities of color in New York City and elsewhere. So part of the racial justice strategy is really shrinking the criminal justice footprint to focus on what really hurts communities. And that, that in turn has the impact on the mass incarceration and, and right. everything like that. All right, you know, this year um, has sort of been an unprecedented attention uh, on policing. Uh, what, what role can the DAs do to respond to the call for police reform and, and police accountability? I have been endorsed by families who lost loved ones to police violence, including names that will be sadly very familiar to listeners, including Valerie Bell, Sean Bell's mother, Victoria Davis, Delron's small sister, and Valerie Castile, um, Philando Castile's mother. And that's based on several years worth of work that I did alongside these women to develop protocols for how prosecutors can ensure that police are held accountable for misconduct and brutality. Because of course, prosecutors work with police because the police very often bring cases into the district attorney's office. But the district attorney's mandate is to serve the entire community. And that includes making sure that when police commit crimes, they're held accountable. Okay, now, but a term, another thing that I'm not 100% clear on, I think a lot of people are confused at, is the term about defunding the police. So, you know, in terms of defunding the police, you know, what, what does that mean to and for DAs? There's tremendous focus now on how resources are being spent. And I think that is very much to the good. John, for the past 
decade, there has been this term in criminal justice academia called justice reinvestment, which essentially means taking money out of punitive responses to criminal conduct and putting it into pro-social supportive services. And that is very hard to argue with. But of course that term didn't catch on until people started calling for defunding the police. And that can mean a whole range of things. But I think that many of us can agree that we have spent far too much as a country keeping people behind bars, punishing people and undermining the health of communities. And if we figure out ways to take those resources and invest them into communities, into prevention, into healing, we will all be better off and safer for it. One, one of the things is, you know, if, if one thing to be the criminal or the convicted, it's another thing to deal with the, the victims or, or the survivors. And, um, you know, I often, you know, think about, you know, survivors of, you know, sex crimes. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what, what are your plans for addressing sex crimes and, and also helping the survivors, you know, of, of those horrific situations? I approach that question the same way I will approach everything as district attorney, which is by going to the people who know it best. And in this case, that is survivors. So in working with survivors of abuse by Harvey Weinstein and other sexual abusers over time, I came to see the ways in which the system was simply not listening to people who were suffering and often re-traumatizing them, failing to provide them with adequate supports and leaving folks without the justice that they so deserve. One example of this that I wouldn't have known but for the fact that I uh, became close to a survivor is that there is no definition in the law for the word consent. And so in the Bill Cosby trial, in the Weinstein trial, jurors were told when they asked the judge, what does consent mean? Which of course is at the crux of so many of these cases. They were told to use their common sense. And when I spoke to survivors, they illuminated for me exactly how problematic this is. And that if we were to define consent as knowledgeable, freely given, and informed agreement, that we would be in a far different place than putting the onus on victims in the way that we do now. New York um, is, is a very, very diverse, having grown up there, I know this, very, very diverse city. Uh, it's very racially diverse. Uh, but I also believe that it is now uh, home to more LGBTQ plus people than any other city in the country. Uh, what can the DA do to support this important sector uh, of the community? Such an important question. And I have spent a lot of time uh, on the campaign and leading up to the campaign talking to community members and advocates to try to better understand the failings of the system for LGBTQ plus community members. Because you're right, we are home to the largest LGBTQ plus population of, of any city in the world. And that is part of our vibrancy as, as a city. So some of the things that I propose to respond to the unique needs of LGBTQ plus community members are developing an office that is accessible and responsive. Developing an office that, that does outreach to those community groups that seeks to build trust and ensure people that they will be heard and listened to and credited when they report crimes. I also know that there is a strong feeling amongst some community members that the lack of police accountability, uh, the, the culture around policing undermines the feeling of health and wellness in LGBTQ plus communities. And so a big part of that is training around police and cultural humility to law enforcement in terms of how people are spoken to and approached in the street. It also means that crimes, uh, hate crimes against LGBTQ plus community members have to be taken incredibly seriously. But at the same time, we need to look at the ways in which some laws enforcement have undermined those communities, including advocating for the repeal of the walking while trans bill that has been used to, uh, to scoop up countless LGBTQ plus community members, in particular Black trans women. And this is the, has been the deadliest year on record, last year, the deadliest year on record for, for Black trans women in this country. So that should be very much of concern. I also believe that we should and must decriminalize consensual sex between adults and that uh, the excessive criminalization of sexuality 
has undermined the health of LGBTQ plus community members. And finally, I think there's real room to expand restorative justice as part of the office's philosophy writ large, but in particular, how it responds to and better supports diverse community members. One of the crises that is you know, facing New York and, and has been uh, for you know, quite some time, I believe, is the homelessness. Um, what can the DA do to address that in the city? This is a shining example of the city's failures around homelessness in general, what has happened in the pandemic. We are in a moment where there are a million New Yorkers out of work and there's a, an increase in street homelessness as anyone would expect. And the criminal justice system for far too long has been a backstop for catching those cases, which it should never have been. And now people are being uh, dropped into shelters without adequate supportive services. So in my plan to address homelessness, I intend to collaborate with other agencies who are better situated to respond to mental health and substance misuse and other drivers of homelessness and invest resources in wraparound services and supportive shelters rather than simply shelter beds. And ultimately, building a New York that takes a housing first approach to handling homelessness, instead of permitting people to cycle through Rikers Island or to cycle through shelter beds. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that uh, you know, has only been exacerbated really by the pandemic uh, in, in New York has been gun violence. Um, again, you, you know, you're, you're restricted as a DA by the laws, but what can the, what can the DA do to address uh, you know, a rise in gun violence that, that New York has seen this past year? Heartbreakingly, we are, have seen the worst gun violence over the past year that we've seen in 14 years after tremendous strides had been made. So I have a plan to build a fast track gun court that will divert all gun cases to a trauma informed judge and attorneys who look to root causes of gun violence and seek to address the root causes to prevent the cyclical nature of gun violence rather than relying on mandatory minimums and three strikes laws and other draconian means of responding punitively, solely punitively to gun violence. But as the only person actually in the, in the campaign who has responded repeatedly to scenes of street gun violence, I am hyper aware of what a, a tragic effect every individual instance of gun violence has on the community. And I believe that it must be a absolute utmost priority of the next district attorney. What would you say differentiates you from your opponents? I am the only candidate in the race who has worked to reform the system from inside and from outside. I have a unique perspective that is informed by everyone who touches the system based on my work closely with victims of the most heinous violent crimes and on my work with incarcerated people who have been re-traumatized by the system by dint of crimes that they committed in some cases many years ago. So what I bring to this is a 360 degree view of the system and everyone it touches. Crime victims, incarcerated people, and the families and communities we all call home. And uh if you are to win the, the DA role, which I believe you will, at the end of your tenure, what, what metrics would you want someone to use to evaluate the job that you did? Well, I'll start by saying that as soon as I take office, I will undertake a version of what has started to happen in Chicago and I expect will start to happen in other cities, which is simply publishing data about what cases are being handled and how they're being treated, and then making it cross-referenceable with demographic data so that the public can actually go on the DA's website and assess where there are racial disparities. Are there racial disparities in rob robberies? Are there racial disparities about whose cases are being indicted or about what the outcomes are? So I will start by publishing data so that I can be account held accountable from day one. But ultimately, the success of a district attorney doesn't turn on recidivism rates and who comes back into the system, although that does reflect a failure 
for district attorneys. And I think that the fact that we have seen so much cycling through the, the system over and over again over the past generation reflects the ways in which the system has failed. What really will measure the success of the district attorney are pro-social measurements. How many people who go through the system as victims or as people charged with crimes are ultimately able to secure stable jobs, find stable housing, be reunited with their children, complete their education, have uh, positive health outcomes. And these are the kinds of things that we should really be factoring in, in assessing whether or not this system is working. And it requires a holistic view that brings to bear not just legal expertise, but the perspectives of clinicians, social workers, and everyone the system touches. Uh, Lucy, I want to, you know, I want to thank you for, for running. Uh, I don't think enough people step up for civic responsibility. And I could truly think of no one better uh, for this position than yourself. You know, if my on-screen characters have taught me anything, it's that we really need to have more women in power. And I know that Lucy is the right woman for this job. So I hope you'll join me in showing her your support tonight. Good luck, Lucy. I'm with you 100%.